Ich bin jetzt so übrig. I want to remind you again that it's Romans 13, 1 through 7 and 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 that are the prime verses. I think I can use the word prime. Or as one fellow said, the mainest verses <laughs> that we want to use. I'll have to repeat a few things as I bring some things together. I give emphasis to all we've studied in the origin of civil government to say that the institution of civil governments, I say plural, was ordained by God. The first institution <coughs> from God, ordained of God for the good of man, was the marriage and the home. Then the idea of the principle of civil governments. And then, of course, the Lord's church. I pause here simply to point out that under Roman Catholicism, they make the church, if you carry out their doctrine to its ultimate conclusion, and at one time they tried to, they make it in control of civil government as well as the home. But that's not the way it's taught in the Bible. And we're trying to understand the very principle of civil government and remembering that it is ordained of God, it flows from God. God is a God of order. And thus, all civil governments offer that order. It's like we said last week in Romans 13, that every soul be subject unto the power of powers, for there is no power but of God. Well, if that's the case, as we said last week, then no power of God, then all power ever, everywhere else is delegated from God. He says then the powers that be are ordained of God. Christians are, uh, all, at least often in different places throughout time, found themselves in a struggle of conscience because they live under all kinds of governments and rulers. Some have decided that since they've been mistreated by government, they were justified in going to war against it. Throughout history, uh, brethren have often disagreed on the subject of how Christians should relate to civil government. And I suggest that if you just go back and study that alone, you'd be studying for a long time as to the viewpoints and ideas and thoughts on that matter. The emphasis of the New Testament is where I want to count for a moment is on the Christian spending his or her time teaching the gospel of Christ. No matter the government they are under. You do not find in the Bible in general, but I'm specifically now thinking of the Christian age and the authority of Christ manifest in the words of the New Testament where Christians are trying to overthrow the civil state. You just don't find it. It's not there. What is there is that the Bible says here's how Christians are to be citizens and model citizens. Uh, even in trying circumstances. And when you consider our present world conditions and the fact that our nation is in a state of great moral decline then I think it's good for us to note God's view of government and just like we say well we better take God's view of marriage and home and we better take God's view of civil government especially our relationship as Christians and the way that term is defined and used in the New Testament as we live in whatever government we're or under. Now I'm going to back up here and uh, cover some things. I've mentioned a few things I haven't in little history. And it takes us back to the world that uh, our Lord lived in. And that means the time in which He lived, suffered, bled, died, was raised from the dead, went back to heaven, and the church started. <coughs> 
And in that first century, while the Roman Empire dominated that part of the world, I do mean dominated it, the New Testament was revealed and the gospel went throughout the world and multiplied hundreds and thousands of people were obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That world was a world of slavery. There were approximately three slaves to every free man in the Roman Empire. And just because you were a free man did not mean you had Roman citizenship. Under the influence of Roman law, a slave was usually considered to be a person owned by another. No rights whatsoever. Like any other personal property, chattel slavery, we would simply say, that person was to be used and disposed of in whatever way the owner saw fit to do so. The Romans themselves base much of their society on the very exploitation of slavery. Uh, I'll pause here and emphasize this, though we've said it at other times. Uh, they weren't concerned about slavery from the standpoint of a certain race or a certain ethnic background or the color of a skin. If you went back to the Roman Empire, you would find out they were slaves from every race that they could get a hold of, of every description. And their economic system had become heavily dependent on the widespread existence of slave labor. They worked in the mines, they worked in the farms, they worked in whatever else was there to work in, potteries or whatever. And the state's public works projects were largely completed and they were maintained by slaves. The government's bureaucracy, state bureaucracy, also depended on educated slaves to keep the administration of the empire running. Uh, you wouldn't find a free person or a free person and a Roman citizen that would not be working through slaves to get a lot of things done. And even key institutions like the state's mints, they minted their money, or the distribution of corn, which was a big deal. They just uh, gave it out to poor Romans. That depended on slaves, too. One of the big things that happened once it became an empire is that the Roman emperor was big on games, keeping the populace settled, happy, and big on giving out free food. And it's interesting to read about some of that stuff, but it was predominant. It's the way they lived. It was part of their fabric. Other educated slaves uh, were kept in private jobs or industries, and they basically kept them going. Accountants, clerks, I don't know how much came would be worth. Do I have a bit? <laughs> Nancy, you get to lead the way. <laughs> and you know, we laugh about that, but we're talking about a time when that was common, when you had slave sales. And again, I want to remind you, you would see any race of people in those sales. Other vital services uh, were, pro were provided by literate slaves, and many of them were highly educated for their day. Teachers. Librarians, it was a big thing to have a real good Greek teacher. I don't mean teaching the language of Greece. Most of them already spoke it. But I'm talking about teachers who were well learned. And uh, they would teach. The scribes, um, artists, J.D., how much are you worth? Uh, <laughs> entertainers, and even physicians. Anywhere you want to look, there would be some slave in it. In the, in the private houses of, of Rome, it was uh, slaves who were the servants, of course, of those Roman masters, which meant they were watching over their private lives. And you can see how that can get to be a rather sticky situation. 
And from the man who therefore cleaned the sewers to the scribe who was the emperor's slave, what do we have? They are an essential part of Roman society. In the later or latter centuries of the Roman Empire, slavery began to gradually decrease. I'll give you one guess as to why later in the empire it started decreasing. Christianity. It made a big difference. They, even when doctrinal matters were becoming compromised, the life taught in the New Testament for the Christian to live, being godly, continued on. And it greatly impressed these people who had no respect for another person's life at all. I think I've told before, and you've probably read it or heard it elsewhere, that uh, it was nothing uncommon for Romans to have a, usually it was a girl, that they didn't want because they had too many or else they were expecting a boy or maybe it's a child that may be somewhat crippled or have problems. They have just exposed it, which meant they took it out in the hills outside the city and left it. It died. Guess what Christians did? They went out there and got them. They took care of them. And to say the least, that made that pagan scratch his head. Because you've got to remember, this kind of attitude had governed things for hundreds and hundreds of years. If you read in the book of Ephesians, where Paul says to the Ephesians when they were outside of Christ, when by nature you did this, doesn't nature, it doesn't mean nature in the sense that you inherited it through genetic properties. It means you've done these kind of things, these heathen things, so long, we would call it second nature to you. You don't think anything about it. But the Christian came into the world and changed a whole lot of things. So slaves begin to dwindle later as far as slavery is concerned. And in effect... Uh, you can just simply put Christianity up into the way it teaches we're to treat one another and respect one another and care for one another and uh, loving your neighbors yourself and the parable of Good Samaritan and all those things. That began to impact people and change them and they saw the benefit and blessings of it. The world of absolute rulers, which is what? The very antithesis of democracy. Uh, was what worked in those days. It had worked for years. What we're saying is all power, in most cases, 99.999% cases, was in one man's hands. I mentioned this, I think, last week. It could have been two weeks ago. But the Roman passion for power is infamous. I doubt we can properly get an understanding of just how the Roman felt about power. I say again, when Mark wrote his gospel, basically for the Latin-speaking people or the Romans, you will see what he does when he writes about Jesus. He writes about Christ's power over and over again. After the reign of Octavius, or who became Caesar Augustus, the Roman Senate really never did what it once did under the Republic. It actually had power under the Republic because everything originated in the Senate. They had certain individuals that they would promote to certain things for a certain period of time, but the Senate controlled. Not after Augustus made an empire. Basically, the Senate existed maybe in a little bit of an advisory capacity, but it basically existed as a rubber stamp to the emperor. And while Augustus and his successors would treat them with uh, some, some respect, I hesitate to even say that, but that would treat them with some respect, because they were valuable to the emperor. Uh, if you think of how politicians like people with influence and money and so forth, that's what these senators basically were, and they would use them. But also later... They would kill them about as regularly as they would anybody else, too, if it didn't suit them. So the real power is in one man. Now think of how large that Roman Empire was, and the power is in one man. In traveling, as I've done, I've been to Israel, 
I've been up in the Greece. I've been to Africa. Been over to England, of course. And the thing that I would think of in every one of those places I went, this at one time, was the Roman Empire. And one man ruled the whole affair. And you go to places in archaeological, archaeological digs where they've dug down to Roman colonies, actually, in, in Wales. And you realize this thing was being conducted just like they did in Rome. And you go anywhere over there and you see these marks of Rome. It was impressive. It's hard for us to understand that. We, have, we haven't lived in a situation that had an empire like that. Especially run as the Roman Empire was. To ensure his own safety, the emperor relied on his per own personal bodyguard. And this is what Paul says, or this bodyguard, from them, some of them, he had converted. When he says Caesar's own house household, it's translated elsewhere, Praetorian Guard. Uh, they were usually German when they started out. They were German. They had to be six feet tall. Now, in that day, when the average person was running around five five and a whole bunch smaller than that, when the emperor came in, little bandy-legged Italian, uh, you might not even see him because he's surrounded by these big, tall, blonde Praetorian guardsmen. <laughs> and everything was designed to say, you don't mess with Texas. <laughs> everything was like that. <laughs> Um, in a few decades, it would begin to realize what kind of power it had, and it would actually serve to overthrow some generals, or rather some emperors. That's another story. It was a world of high taxes. Few people I know in government today would have rejoiced in that much of the Roman Empire. They might not live very long, but while they did, they would rejoice greatly. The census was used for military service and taxation. Thus, about the birth of Christ, why, does Joseph, why did Joseph and Mary end up down in Bethlehem? Because down there, all the Jews went to their native city where their tribe was relocated. And why were they doing that? Caesar Augustus declared that there would be a census. Well, it was just simply to find out who's there to tax. That's all it was. But the Jews were exempt, I think I said this last week, from Roman military service. Reading from John H. Walton, editor of the Archaeological Study Bible, he says, With the establishment of the empire, Augustus Caesar created a regular bureaucracy for conducting the census and collecting taxes. And he cites, by the way, Luke 2, where you have that about Christ's birth. The provinces were subject, subjected to both a poll tax and a land tax. The revenue supported the army, the imperial household, government salaries, road maintenance, and public works, as well as the dole of grain for the Roman masses. Now, who collected the taxes in, in Israel? Yeah, Matthew did. Not that Matthew. But the publican, the tax collector, they all did. And they were hired out to the Roman government. And as a Jew, hired out of the Roman government to tax your own people, especially with most of them, if you had $10 to pay, they might charge 40 because they got theirs and so forth and all that kind of stuff. And that was what was done, and Jews hated them for it. It was a world of persecution. This is where it's hard. And we mention it sometimes in, in the idea of their attitude of a slave. And we say it was chattel slavery. It was just a piece of property to do with as you please. But it went further than that among the Romans. People, as far as they were concerned, were simply chattel to the Romans. What do I mean? Make a difference who you were. If you got in their way, you shouldn't. And if they could use you, they would. And they did. And they killed people right and left, too. In Roman society, people were treated differently. In other words, they were very much respecters of persons according to wealth and gender and citizenship. Now, women didn't have the right to vote or to hold office. This developed among the Roman higher classes, a conniving bunch of people in the Roman wives. 
because they couldn't officially out and open do things by the power of Roman government because of the position they held the law allowed them, but they sure could work behind the scenes. And I suggest to you, if you want to see some of that, read Suetonius' Lives of the Twelve Caesars, and you'll see just how manipulative they were. You'll see a bit a little more about it, just from the Bible, uh, who really got John the Baptist's head cut off? It's Herodias. <laughs> who did it? Uh, Herod was too much of a coward, but she goaded him, set up the whole thing, even used her daughter to get it to work. And that was not just that one place. That is all over the place. In fact, you ought to read about, because the record is there, about, remember, she, Herodias, was Herod's brother Philip's wife, but you ought to read all about how that came to be. I don't know why somebody hasn't made a soap opera out of that. If you had more money... You got more voting power. And this may sound unfair, but it was a big change from other civilizations where the average person in those civilizations had no say at all. Again, I said that the slaves were chattel, of course. They were simply subject to the will of their masters. And they had there's nothing to do about it. They had no nobody to protect them. They couldn't go get a lawyer or whatever to protect them. Uh, and the Romans were merciless overall when they inflicted punishment on the slaves. Hard labor, uh, whippings, uh, branding. They would break joints or break bones. Uh, branding in the forehead, which would usually be a letter denoting the slave as some runaway or a thief or liar. And of course, in his crucifixion, these were all punishments that were readily used day by day. It would be very hard to go down a road and enter into a city or someplace like that and not see the results of this all the time. When uh, in AD 70, when the Jews were destroyed by the armies of Rome under Titus, they crucified hundreds of thousands of them, right down side each side of the road, one right after the other. You're, you've all heard of Spartacus, the slave who rebelled and took place back in the days of the Republic. They did the same thing to those slaves they captured, and they depict that in the movie made after that. They were thrown to wild beasts in the circuses and torn up by them, and they were burned alive. Remember, Nero took some of the Christians and dipped them in tar and put them upon poles to light his gardens at night. So, yes, we're in bad shape in the sense of what we're leaving and departing from and apostatizing from in a way of morals and a lot of other things. But uh, we don't compare to that. Could we ever get that far down the drain? What's to say? Once you leave, once you leave, barring God's interference providentially, once you leave the standards of conduct that is the New Testament, people go about as far as they're capable of going. Look at the communists and look at the uh, Nazis. That's interesting. This is what they were in when the New Testament came in and, and a letter to the church in Imperial Rome, the core of all of this, has a chapter in it as we call it, dealing with the origin of civil government and the Christian's responsibility as a Christian, under that. You remember that was raised with Christ as to the disciples' responsibility before there was a church established. And uh, Matthew 22, 15 through 22 gives us the whole thing. Matthew 22, 15 through 22. But basically he said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things under Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And if you'll remember the people... Didn't know what to do about that. But that tells me something. That God in His infinite wisdom in ordaining civil governments made a difference in things that are peculiar strictly to civil government. Which, by the way, along with the home, is to only last as long as time lasts. And it's for this present world. 
So I learned to begin with that Christ did not come seeking social change. He did not come to overthrow civil government. He did not come to have a sitting in the temple. He did not come to have a civil rights march down the streets of Rome. That's not in your New Testament. It doesn't even hint at that kind of activity of Christians dealing with civil governments. And you couldn't get much worse than what I don't think you could as far as what Roman civil government was. So the problems of their day, about 2,000 years ago, regardless of how bad some things seem today in America, were far worse than most people could ever think about it being. And yet, the birth of Christianity, Christian conduct under the authority of Christ, there was none of that business of let's, let's overthrow Rome. Now, there was a way to overthrow Rome, and they did. And that is by preaching the gospel and by upholding the truth of God and morals. <coughs> and the worth and dignity of man who is made in the image of God. Christians should not be known as civil protesters, as those who criticize and demean authority. We must speak out against sin and immorality, and that without hesitation, consistently and steadfastly. But we must honor those who have authority over us, even when we have to hold our nose to do so. How do I know that? Because I can read my New Testament of Jesus Christ that was written under that terrible authority of the Roman Empire and instructions by the Lord and through inspiration of how a Christian is to conduct himself. Here is a quote from H.C.G. Moule, the Epistle of the Romans, page 349. As a fact, I'm quoting, as a fact, the supreme magistrate for the Roman Christians in the year 58 was a desolate young man, intoxicated by the discovery that he might do almost entirely as he pleased with the lives around him. By no defect, however, in the idea of and purpose of Roman law. But by fault and of the degenerate world of the day, yet civil authority, even with a Nero at its head, was still in principle a thing divine. The relation of Christians to civil governments therefore raises the question, and that's where we've been in our study on this, what is civil government? We say that sometimes without even thinking much about what we're saying, civil government. Well, you've got the civil government, you have the church, and you have the home. Well, what do we mean when we say civil government? In the negative, civil, civil government is not necessarily moral government and really doesn't even pertain to moral government. The civil government does not legislate morality, but rather what is civil in society. I've, I've often wondered if we think through things very much with the plural, pluralism of our society, and here I mean pluralism that has all these different religions in it nowadays, more than when I grew up, and has all these different people and their American citizens. but I really don't think they ought to have the rights that I do because I'm a Christian. And this guy over here is a Buddhist. And this one is Hindu. And this was Muslim, and we're not talking about Muslims trying to overthrow things. The question is, do they, do they have rights like I do, or should they be second, third, fourth, fifth class citizens? And who, who should we have a right to pray in the public schools supported by the taxes that they pay, you know? See, it's one thing to view the United States as if everybody in here believed in God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the New Testament. And that's where we're going to run it. 
So we thumb our noses at the Hindu who didn't have any rights in the United States. Does the Bill of Rights cover a Hindu who's a bona fide citizen? Does it cover a Muslim? Does it cover anything like that? Indeed it does. That poses a problem. The civil government is not designed to punish immorality, but rather that which is uncivil. Well, I want you to think about that for a while. We'll say more about that later. We owe Caesar only what is civil. We owe God that which is moral and religious. Does that mean in our form of government we don't want to elect people who are moral? Well, I think we ought to try to find uh, an Apostle Paul running for president. Or Peter, run him for something. Most people that know what they knew and sacrificed what they did still believe their primary purpose was Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things you add unto you. Because you see, none of them ever had any idea whatsoever of Western democracies as we've all grown up. They had no idea at all. And don't, we don't need to get to the stage where we think the only place you can be a faithful child of God and there can ever be a restoration of primitive purity and of Christianity is in the United States. That doesn't, when you say things like that, people say, well, you don't care anything about this country. No. I just know that God did not ordain this kind of government. Is it best? I believe it with all my heart. I, I don't know how a better could come along and we're losing this about as fast as you can. But I believe the church can exist in Russia. I believe it could exist there when communism was there because I know it did. I know preachers that went in behind the Iron Curtain and they preached the gospel. Right now, there are Chinese brethren in Southeast Asia who still work it out, although it has to be rather secret, and go into China and preach. Civil statutes define crime, not sin. Divine statutes deal with sin, but not necessarily crime. While it's not the function of civil government to legislate morality, but rather what is civil, they do enforce certain Moral precepts. Murder, perjury, lying, and theft. But they do so not as commands of Jehovah God Almighty, but as violations of civil relations. And that's what would happen in, in a totalitarian government. You know, you can be guilty of libel or something like that in a totalitarian government. You, you can lie <laughs> under a totalitarian government. Civil government does not enforce the commands of God. For then it would have to pass legislation on evil thoughts and lusts. And in this country, if it's going to pass on religious matters. Whose religion? The history of the Holy Roman Empire, and that's another good study, with all of our history of religious bishops and political rulers, popes and emperors, provide ample proof that the functions of religious and political administration should remain completely separate. Now, our founding fathers understood that. If the government were to adopt the gospel as the code of civil law, then it would be the duty of the courts to forgive every murderer or felon without respect of persons, and that would destroy civil governments completely. Likewise, if the legal and penal statutes of civil government were adopted religiously, it would destroy the blessings of the gospel. There is a reason that we point out in the beginning studies of the Bible and right in the dividing the word of truth that the home was the first God-ordained institution, then the concept of civil governments, and then the church. 
And when they're conducted as they ought to be conducted, they all work in harmony with one another. Not a one usurps the other's authority. Well, Catholicism didn't learn that. It really learned it in this sense. They just simply took the power away from them and wouldn't let them do what they like to do. I do not think, for my feeble mind, that there's no greater mark of political wisdom than that which was displayed by the Founding Fathers of this republic. Listen, the First Amendment, the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States says, Congress shall make no laws respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, does that only apply to Christians? They knew that. And if we're going to start appealing, and it's pretty good that we would, to the Founding Fathers, they have a lot to say. We've got to remember that. Somebody saw the need to put that up as Amendment Number 1 under the Bill of Rights. Well, i got five minutes till 2 o'clock. I guess I'll quit. So we'll have to go over two weeks from now after Eric makes all of the corrections that I, where I made mistakes all this time. And he'll do that next week. Huh? Well, he'll, that's the only chance he gets. He can keep coming back as long as life's in his body and he's able to do it and keep on doing it. Now, the biggest thing I want to come out of this is that we need to do some serious thinking about some things that were thought very thoroughly through before our country came into existence because they faced these things. And it makes a great deal of difference as to how we do. We're going to look next time, Lord willing, at, the, at Romans uh, 13.1, Government Ordained by God. And I hope you'll be piling all this stuff together from what we've said before. But if you're not a Christian... You may be a fine, upstanding citizen of these United States of America, but you're lost in sin. And this country and its government and every other country, as it's already happened in the past, will at least by the time the world ends cease to exist. But the everlasting kingdom won't. And that's where Christians and all that of Christ means to each member of it, citizen of the kingdom of heaven, should be placing their emphasis spreading the borders of the kingdom. Because you can spread the truth of the gospel that saves us from our sins and it knows no boundaries but the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you will believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins, the Lord will add you to that kingdom as a citizen. You can be faithful to your King because it's not a republic. It is a kingdom. And Christ has all authority. If you will obey the gospel, you'll be free from your sins. A member of that church and kingdom Child of God, are you a faithful citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Are you a good citizen in the kingdom? Are you worth something to your king? Is he your sovereign? Is he your master? If you sin in some way, you need to repent of those sins and ask God for forgiveness. He will do so. Now is the time to do that while you have the time as we stand and sing.